you guys doing? Uh, I'm Hadi Baldaji from Cause of a Kind. I'm a software engineer. Uh, today, I'll be joined by Mike. He's the CTO at Cause of a Kind. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, React Native and Flutter. Uh, we're going to talk about each platform. Uh, why do we think each is better than the other one? And uh, yeah, let's get started. Hey, Mike, can you introduce yourself? How's it going, Hadi? As, as you already said, I'm Mike. I'm CTO here at Cause of a Kind. Um, and yeah, I'm excited about this episode because uh, cross-platform app development is something we love here. And, uh, you know, obviously as an agency, it's very cost effective for clients to do this. So I think these are the two kind of big contenders. So I think it's going to be a fun one to, to get everybody into. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so basically, we all know that Flutter is faster than React Native uh, because it compiles directly to, to Native. Uh, but why, why do you think we should we should still use React Native? Like, wh why wouldn't you switch from React Native to Flutter? Yeah, so so for yeah, me, awesome. you know, the reason that I wouldn't switch from, from React Native to Flutter is, is namely the, the React ecosystem, right? So I think that a lot of us, you know, on the agency side, usually almost every company comes with a web app. Those web apps are typically built in React, especially if they're built by us. So using React Native kind of makes a lot of sense, right? We already have a lot of React developers. It's very easy for them to jump into React Native projects. It's very familiar. Um, so despite the speed, right, we talk about like speed in the app, right? Um, you know, you have to really ask yourself, when does this start to become a problem, right? There's, there's a lot of people that use different programming languages, right? We, we have fast programming, like Rust is a great example. It's a fast programming language, yeah. but it takes me much longer to launch an app. So maybe I'm still going to use Python, right? And try and get things like type safety from type hinting and things that I would miss from something, from moving to something like Rust. Um, so I think the same concept happens. We say like, all right, well, Flutter's faster than React Native. Well, how much faster, right? Is the, and, uh, you know, is my time to market going to be faster or the ergonomics or the developer experience? A lot of people talk about, you know, developer experience is something that like only the developer cares about. But on the agency side, this equates to the amount of hours you're paying for, yeah. right? If the developer experience is brutal um, or if it's taking longer, you're, your kind of your costs are going up as a as a as a company. So I think that's one of the re areas where React Native it has over recent years done very well, um, especially if you're using a tool like Expo. So I think that's one of the, you know that's where the skepticism comes in. Now, Flutter, what's good about it? why would we even consider it? Is it just the speed thing? Well, I think the cool thing about Flutter is that it can com it, it's a truly single code base for web and native applications. Whereas React Native isn't quite there, right? There, there are people who use like Next.js and they, they to, my, to my knowledge, you really can't say like all these components are just gonna get shared exactly the same. Like, like you still have a React Native code base and you still have your React web app code base living there. So, so the, that's where the, Flutter started to appeal to me. Uh, so the main difference between React and React Native, like why it's not a single code base are divs to views and display flex by default is row on uh, react and it's colon on react native but and navigation changes that's it but how good is flutter web i'm, I'm not even sure how good flutter web is that i don't think it's a single code base i think they have the same problem as react react native uh on the component side you still need to uh, compile or translate some of the components to make them work on web uh yeah i think so too. I, I think there's kind of two ways to do it because there is a flutter angular project mm -hmm. that people have talked about which will like let but i think that the abstraction is slightly better where you know if you're using flutter angular i think that you are the the system is able to understand the two um and and keep them more closely aligned that was my impression i think that the the bigger question um it starts to come up with specifically with flutter is it's really only client side rendering yeah. which for a password protected web app is fine but for web apps with public facing features for instance we just launched a project like this where a lot of the pages are public they're going to be seo optimized they have to be server rendered right and uh, you know uh, we can get into a bigger conversation about server side rendering too but 
that that's where Flutter starts to falter, along with other frameworks that are exceptional app frameworks. Elm being an example I use all the time. It's a great app framework, but without server side rendering, the way that something like uh, Next.js would have out of the box, it becomes untenable because we're all worried about the search engine problem. Um, you know. Uh, taking speed out of it because right server side render there's like some ux performance improvements that you can get there but assuming you have an app with high enough intent i would say the client side rendering is often good enough um so those are kind of my my thoughts on like where flutter could falter is with react and react native maybe you have these kind of two separate code bases i can still have my next js um code base ready to go and server side rendering happens right there as well. So that, that, that I think is something where when you choose Flutter, you, you're really bought into only client side rendering. There's no option for that anymore. Yeah. So, so to give some context to people who maybe don't know both platforms well, uh, so, Dart, so Dart is the primary language for Flutter. Uh, React uses JavaScript, basically. So if you know JavaScript, you can build quickly in React, you can build quickly in React Native. It's it's really the same language you're using. Maybe a few components are changing. The learning curve is pretty quick. So from JavaScript to React and React Native, it would take you less than a week or two to actually get started and build an app or a website. Uh, with Flutter, you're learning a whole new language. Even though it's faster, is it really that much better that you you would go for learning a new language to actually start building with Flutter. So this is the main question we're addressing right now. Uh, That's, yeah, th this is kind of interesting, right? Because, uh, you know, and how big is that leap, right? So I think one of the things when I look at Dart, for us particularly, we're building almost everything in TypeScript. We really don't use JavaScript at all anymore. And when I look at Dart, it's kind of almost this it's very similar to typescript with like a few things flipped around i say right like i think the async keyword happens like in a different spot or you know it, it, it's so it i think it would be very easy for you to go from typescript to dart um i think darts type system is a little bit better than than typescripts in, inside like so when i was looking at kind of dart um as a language in general i mean on the client side, you're still having this compile to JS situation. Not you're not like compiling to native binary, but uh, like a like a standard compiled language would be. But I do think the tooling around Dart, arguably, you know, some people have said it's a little bit better than TypeScript in terms of like the the type safety that it that it gives you the type guarantees it gives you. You know, you can turn off kind of the the null and and um, you know. Uh, all these different kind of things that maybe people get annoyed with with TypeScript, and I we could do a separate kind of episode on, on stuff like that because I, I I personally have not spent a ton of time with Dart, yeah. um, but I think that's kind of the Dart was kind of designed to originally be like the JavaScript killer, right? I think the Dart was supposed to run in Chrome natively too. At yeah. once upon a time, I think that Google had the intent of Dart being the second client side language you could use. Um, as opposed to JavaScript and, and run it right in the browser, which does have a bit of an appeal to me because I do think that that whole like TypeScript compiled to JS and anyone who's used TypeScript kind of enough knows that like, you know, you, you get the, the checks, but then there's times when there's like all these kind of gray areas that happen and you have to introduce other libraries. I think the biggest one is around JSON decoding, um, you know, Basically, TypeScript will let you do that the way you do in JavaScript, but then it gives it this implicit any type, and that can just kind of run through your code base kind of rampantly, right? And I, I think Dart avoids a lot of that by being a little bit stricter. Um, yeah, what, what is the assumption with ty the TypeScript assumes your pro program is correct until proven otherwise. That's sort of that's the, the, the beauty and the curse of it, yeah. right? People who are real strong type performance uh, proponents are kind of... Um, against that idea but for for people like us where we're like training newer devs that come from dynamic languages it's a lot easier to say oh just kind of write typescript and then start to lock it down as you learn more it, it definitely lends itself to a more like uh i don't know an, an expressive language it, le it lends itself to this more experimental coding um yeah. so, more so than, actually, than that yeah so this actually brings me to my next point which is the community around each framework so for React Native, you have a huge community with 
like thousands and thousands of packages that you can just use. Like I want a calendar. I don't even need to use the, the React Native calendar. I will just go for a, for a package. I want progress bars, what, whatever you may need, uh, location things, you have Google Maps, you have everything. Uh, Flutter's community, and it's all open sourced. Flutter's community is more close around Google products. So you, so basically Flutter was made with Android Studio in mind and Android development in mind before it was iOS in mind. React and React Native didn't care which platform you use it for, so they just made it for both in all, for all cases, for all use cases. And Fl I don't think Flutter is open source. I don't think so. That I am actually not, that I'm not sure if I thought it was, let, let's do a quick uh, check. I wish we had a little fact checker over here, <laughs> um, but I'm not sure actually. Yeah. So, so the community around React Native is so much bigger and you can just contribute to packages that you use more. So if there's this package that we use a lot uh, at cause of a kind, for example, and we need a new feature, we could just contribute to that package and make it better. The Flutter packages, I think they call them uh, uh, two twig hub. No, uh, twiggles toggles. Uh, they, they have a, they have a name widget. So, so yeah, widget. widget right. Yeah. So com packages are called widgets or components, I think. Uh, and those widgets are all built by Flutter, so they have their own UI library. So you don't have the, the ability to use something like Material UI or something like that, like we do in React Native or React. Uh, they have their own UI library that you can use, but I'm not sure if you can contribute to it, if you can help make it better or or what. So this is, we, we bring up some interesting points that probably is worth clarifying for people, right? So there's Flutter, which is the cross-platform framework. And then there's Dart, which is the language that you're writing in. So Flutter, like, so Dart has a package manager and I think it's like, it has its own, it's like pub.dev yeah. is like Dart, you can have Dart packages and that's just for the language as a whole. And then there's the idea of Flutter only packages, which we're talking like widgets. Yeah. NPM kind of coalesces everything together, right? Like it's just sort of like, it's all JavaScript types. Well, NPM is not even Java, just JavaScript and TypeScript anymore. Right? They, yeah, they, they also uh, have Angular stuff. They, they've got a lot of everything, right? Yeah, that, that's so there's a so I think that you know, the, the thing that so I think this is that's one thing to kind of keep in mind for people is like there, there's there's Dart the language, there's Flood of the framework. Um, and could you, yeah, w w would is there eventually a world where like you could use Dart to write React? applications that's kind of an interesting well so so then you, you talked about material yeah. which mui that's a google product i believe there's material angular which you could use if you were using flutter dart angular mm. and one of one of the things that i like about Ang and i do not write much angular at all but one of the things that i liked about angular is that it's an, a one-stop shop you know whereas react kind of had this principle of like there's all these little things you put together and sometimes you spend a lot of time putting all this junk together or, and, or you do what kind of we did is, you know, we have Next.js and they keep adding things that we use every time. And we have like a bunch of boilerplates that just like, these are all the packages we like to use. Yeah. This is the state management library is that Angular kind of has a concept for every, all of that, you know, and it's all baked right into the framework. And I think that that was one of the appeals to Dart and Flutter to me is like, I like how, I love this idea of like, Hey, there's like a, there's a convention over configuration kind of uh, bias with these things, which has which has pros and cons. Um, and so you kind of come in and you're like, hey, there's a Flutter way to do this. And you don't have to think too much. And the same thing with Angular. It's like, there's just one way to kind of handle this. And like, if you want to handle global state management or state that has to propagate or observables, you know, I think Angular uses RxJS, but they kind of have a prescribed way to handle all of that. Um, and Again, you know, and, and I, I guess I could see, you know, Google doing a pretty good job of maintaining that because they have done a pretty good job of making sure Angular is quite buttoned up. I think that there's a lot, you know, over the years with React where there, there's a lot of stuff that the community's learned over time, but there, there is a niceness to, you know, and, and that beckons the reason, like, why do why did Node kind of take off over some of the old MVC frameworks like Rails, right? Is I think ultimately people kind of like that, like, bolt-on approach, because as, like, the community shifts to things that are maybe more serverless or more Jamstack, I can kind of 
I can tweak the architecture more. Um, and, and I think that with these other frameworks, everyone's managed to figure out how to do that to kind of move into the future, but it's always kind of a, it, it moves it away from it's like MVC kind of roots. And so with Flutter, I would imagine that if ever there were some new conventions getting used, you would sort of find ways to do it, but it would be a little less easy than it is with React, which is like this very atomic kind of feel to it. Um, so it's interesting. It, it, again, it's, it's interesting kind of where you prefer. I think it would be very easy to get started in Flutter and just like learn all the Flutter ways to do it and never have to leave the Flutter or Dart ecosystem ever. Yeah. You know, like, like you, 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 like, I, I think that you, that I think that's generally kind of the approach there is like, this is going to be your one stop shop. Yeah, that, that actually makes sense. Uh, but when you're using something like Expo, for example, you can literally launch an app, like not really launch it, but you can actually build an app and submit it to the App Store or Play Store in, in less than an hour. Like that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So do you think that is Expo plus React Native really more the equivalent to Dart and Flutter? Like it's it's really not React Native versus Flutter. It's sort of like Expo React Native. I feel like kind of gets you closer to the Flutter offer. Yeah, I'd, I'd say yes, because if if you can really package, actually, yeah, Flutter packages everything by itself and you can Flutter submit stuff, which, yeah, they, they have the data ecosystem blocked out basically into a Flutter ecosystem. So yeah, I think I think Flutter plus Dart would be the equivalent of of Expo React Native, yeah. Yeah, right. That's a, that sounds about right. And I feel you know. And again, I, I would love like so. I think it's like a follow up, right? We've talked about this. Is like we sort of almost need to kind of create two of the exact same thing in both frameworks, and sort of see what the the pros and cons. I definitely think though that the play on speed, as you said, is. I don't think that's going to appeal to as many people as, as maybe the Flutter community thinks. Like, oh, we're technically fast. Like, you know, I've seen really great apps that were built completely in web views that outperformed um, other, you know, yeah. native apps. So, so uh, you know, I, I at previous jobs, we had iOS and Android teams. And their big thing is like, yeah, we have this amazing app. It's so much faster. It's so much faster. Well, someone does an experiment. And, uh, you know, I'll keep the company nameless. And they, they just loaded web views into the app. Um, and the idea was, could we switch to React Native, right? So they were, and the, the real big question is the speed, right? Everyone goes, oh, well, we're going to lose users because of the speed, because React Native will be slower. And they're like, well, let's do something even slower. Let's just make a web view version with like PhoneGap or Cordova, I think, and see how it performs. Perform the same. The intent is there. The u so for the user using the app, they still wanted to use the app. The speed was not super noticeable to them. So like the, the, the big thing is if you're using a lot of really deep native phone features, like you're going to use some like machine learning that's baked into an iOS device. Well, then I'd say you probably need to get into the Swift and, and you know, you're going to have. But most people are not building apps like that. They're sort of just building a skin of their they're building a version of their website with an app. Exactly. This is where. And so then like. Where speed, you know, the web was the web view that slow. Well, well, it turned out to not be that slow. Well, then ultimately the decision came in and be like, well, React Native will be right in between the two of these things, and we'll get to, we won't have to maintain three different software teams. Yeah. That's that I like the, you know, I think people have to look at that too. What is the cost of me having three different streams of development? You know, what is the cost of me having to have a Swift team, a Kotlin team, and a web team? And coordinating releases around all of those things. I think one of the uh, you know one of the other big big issues you run into is like where the business logic. You know sometimes that starts to creep into the client side, and then now you're replicating all this. The, you know the business logic shouldn't necessarily live on the client side. Another debate, but you inherently have some UI logic, and now you have to replicate that three different times. And when you switch to something like React Native or Flutter. It, it is, argu you know, arguably that can now truly be shared. So even though with React Native, you may have to build new components, a lot of the hooks and business logic, I think, can be reused yeah. across both. So that's really, that's the difficult stuff to share. And now, now you sit here and say, like, what's the development cycle? And then we can go, let's talk, like, what was the advantage to the web view, right? Why would anybody do this? Well, I don't have to do a cut 
on iOS anymore in a release cycle. Every time I, I don't have to wait for users to upgrade, right? I can literally push updates. Like the app can remain the same and I can push more into the app without waiting for users to update, um, which is something that doesn't happen all the time. Like yeah. A lot of people just don't update any of their apps. <laughs> uh, actually, is there a feature uh, like code push or expo updates, uh, like OTA updates for Flutter? Oh, very cool. This I didn't know about. So it's feature like Airbnb updates the app or, or like a lot. Uh, Facebook, Insta, WhatsApp, you see changes uh, per country, per language, per and like the app change without you updating it, actually. And those are really important features that could be if you want to fix a bug on the JavaScript side. Absolutely. So, so both React and Flutter have this feature. Oh, OK. No, do, did you, you were saying that Flutter has the feature? I, I wasn't sure if Flutter has a feature that, like that. Like, I, 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 you know what? And, like, I actually don't know. Expo has an but over React Native does. Yeah. And there's code push from Microsoft uh, for React Native, but I'm not sure if they handle Flutter yet. Like Flutter is pretty uh, new compared to React Native. So not like they just got on the web like recently, like I think last year or two years ago. So I'm not sure if, if everything's supported yet. I'm seeing for Flutter, there's a library, it's called Chimera mm -hmm. that, that just came up when I Googled like Flutter code push. Um, we'd have to dig more into this, but yeah, I, I think code push is an amazing thing to have in your back pocket. And I know Expo definitely has mm -hmm. features like that um, baked into it. And I think that's like a huge advantage over native native development, like writing Swift and, and Kotlin. And, yeah, you can't um, you can't update the code. No, it's a, and you could have you know you have vulnerabilities and things and and let me tell you the ergonomics of kind of developing around that idea of like waiting for people to update and get feedback on new features, right? Like let's say you're A/B testing new features every single time you release them on the web you can do this instantly and you can get a massive user set on the device. You're sort of waiting for people to update, to update, to update. And then like you sort of have to put them, but then how do you handle control groups? It's, it's like even slower to get to a, a statistically significant result. Um, and code push kind of gets you away from that. Uh, so there, I think that that's another great advantage just to cross platform dev. I think it's like if, if both flutter and react native have that, we could talk about, you know, which one is better. Um, so yeah, th I think this is uh, quite interesting. Um, it it's an exciting time to be kind of, I don't know, uh, I think it's an exciting time to be a developer right now because it's never been easier to kind of work across both. That's true, that's true. So I think this is our time. Uh, thank you so much, Mike, for, uh, uh, for being our guest today. You've been amazing. Uh, thank you everyone who's been listening or watching. Uh, and yeah, that's it, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Adi. We'll talk soon. Awesome. Bye-bye.